finally we can all relax. The truth is marching on. <laughs> At least right here in the corner of 13th East and 607. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the First Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City on this, our 128th anniversary. It was precisely, all right. It was precisely 128 years ago on February 24th, 1891, that 127 charter members began the long journey of liberal religion in Salt Lake City. And what a fine bunch they were. But I sometimes wonder, what were they thinking? <laughs> how, how did they imagine what their church would look like in 2019? I really don't think they would be disappointed. In fact, I think that they would be grateful and proud of us today as much as we are grateful and proud of them. This church institution has rekindled the faltering hopes of generations of Unitarians to help us see our way through dark and troubled times. And this church has always miraculously managed to, to keep the vision of our common humanity. On this, our 128th anniversary, we carry the memories of those who began this journey of progressive thinking and who tapped the spirit of reaching out to touch the lives of those who struggle in life, those who face so many injustices because simply of who they are. On this, our 128th anniversary, we pause to honor life's possibilities. Always grateful for a world awaiting the work of our minds and our hearts. Symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. And of course, in the spirit of our church's anniversary, the choir is adding a bit to the antiquity with some, some old songs gathered from the shelves. We appreciate that very much. When I, uh, when I was in college, I worked in a bookstore in New York. It was, the bookstore was in Penn Station, and Madison Square Garden was above the bookstore. The bookstore owner about 60 years old at the time, never, never really wandered too far from Madison Square Garden where the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, performed whenever they were in the city. And as a young man, he in fact performed for Ringling Brothers. He was an acrobat. He stood only about five feet, six inches tall but he was also about five feet six inches wide. <laughs> and it was upon his shoulders that all the other acrobats stood, doing fancy stuff, defying stuff, always, always so graceful. And all eyes were upon the, the women on top doing just amazing, dazzling stunts. Nobody really paid attention to the stout guy on the bottom. And yet without his strength, the whole act would collapse. I feel like we're standing on 
the shoulders of those who came before us about six, maybe seven generations ago, the steady ones, those whose liberal beliefs were firmly planted, strong enough to hold those who came later to finally where we are now. Right now, we're, we're playing to the crowd of cheering liberals, balancing progressive ideals on top of a shaky national order. And all eyes are upon us as we try to bend that moral arc towards justice. But today, we celebrate those upon whose shoulders we stand. We honor those who, who opened the doors to this church. And of course, the Salt Lake religious, social, and political landscape was never the same again after that. And those, those people who made this church possible today are our heroes. They are the steady ones holding us up as we, frankly, do amazing things to help our neighbors, to protect the earth, to somehow manage to celebrate life in hard times. You know, the very last line of our opening hymn this morning spoke of a prophetic church, that the prophetic church and the future awaits our ministry. So this congregation, the work that we do now, which sometimes feels a little frustrating, will nevertheless impact the future. And the prophetic ministry, which has been honored in this church since 1891, impacts us today. It informs who we are and what we must do. It feels like we've, we've built this, this human ladder of Unitarian ideals, aspirations, good works. And on this ladder, you got generation upon generation upon generation, and up, up we go towards, towards the future. Today, our church's anniversary, we look with gratitude to those standing on the bottom holding us up. We wouldn't be here today if our forebears didn't have the strength and courage to plant themselves squarely on religious soil. May we be forever grateful, and recognize those who had liberal minds and strong shoulders 128 years ago. <laughs>
Well, happy birthday. How does it feel to be 128? You look great, right? You're aging well. <laughs> happy birthday to our church and to its continued mission of liberal religion in Salt Lake Valley. In preparing for this day, Reverend Tom and I were thinking about how the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I wanted to bring you a reading from a sermon by our founding minister, Reverend Samuel Atkins Elliott, that to me sounded an echo from over a century ago to today. Now, the story about Reverend Elliot is that he was serving a congregation in Denver and got lonely that there weren't a lot of Unitarians in the Mountain West and thought, where, where would be a good place to plant another church? And he thought, Salt Lake City's got potential. <laughs> and the American Unitarian Association sort of was like, what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I can relate to that because uh, j almost two years ago, I was considering a move to Salt Lake City, and my friends in the South were like, what is in Salt Lake City? Well, I can tell you now, <laughs> it's really great. And so uh, I'm sure that Reverend Elliot saw the same wonderful things that I see here too. So this is an excerpt from a sermon called The Spirit That Makes Men Free. And as you listen to these words, you'll remember that Reverend Elliot was a Unitarian Christian and that this was a liberal Christian church. Um, though we as a people may no longer place our faith in Christianity as the best hope for the world, I think you can still find a lot here that rings true. Too often we have been told that the true Christian life is one of withdrawal from the clash and conflict of common experience. It is a life of gentle endurance and placid devotion. To my mind, that is a distortion and a perversion of the teaching of the New Testament. The Christian life is not all a matter of passive virtue and meek submission. I cannot help thinking that we have not had enough of the power of righteous wrath in our moral ideals. To many of us, the ideal Christian has been a man half of whose faculties are in abeyance, a life as innocent of flavor as the white of an egg. Resistance to evil is not to my mind a failure of religion, but a positive sign of an intelligent spiritual life. Anger against iniquity is not a failure of character. It is the evidence of moral health. If our religion prevents us from vindicating some imperiled right, if it destroys our ability to be indignant against outrage or impairs our discriminating judgment between the principles that are worth perpetuating and those that ought to be destroyed. If our religion is to level our emotions to one tepid sentiment of acquiescence, then surely we have need of a new birth of the spirit of life. I'm not saying that Christianity is to be identified with any political system or that it is tied to any transient or perishable ideal of social organization. Its impulses and ideals have entered into the hearts of men under many different forms of government. It has modified the evils and developed the good of feudal, monarchial, imperial, and democratic institutions alike. The point is that it has worked not through the institutions of law or statecraft or diplomacy, but through the motives and forces of moral and spiritual regeneration. Have we not had too much of the superficial optimism that would have us believe that intellectual and moral differences are only superficial, that no man really means to be cruel and rapacious, that what we call error is only truth in the making, and what we call evil 
only goodness insufficiently developed. Has not that kind of easy tolerance been too characteristic of the religious liberalism in which you and I were bred? Is it not time that we recognize that there are terrible evils in the world that must be confronted and overthrown and that there are fundamental conflicts of ideals which must be fought out. There can be no mild neutrality when the issues of righteousness and justice are drawn. We currently have about 15 people actively engaged in writing the history of this church from 1991 to the present. Our last effort to produce our church's history resulted in the publication called Unitarianism in Utah, which was released at the centennial anniversary of this church in 1991. The book was compiled by Laurel Miller, a member of First Church, and also Stan Larson, a librarian in the special collections at the Marriott Library. 
it always, it always warms my heart to think that this church is the history of Unitarianism in the entire state. No institution representing progressive religious ideas ever existed prior to us. It makes me want to say, we are the way and the truth and the light. <laughs> no, one, no one comes to Unitarianism except through us. <laughs> now that's a, that's a lot of power, but in Utah, we'll take whatever we can. Our new history book will be called 2020, which not only takes us up to the present, but also provides a little double entendre in that 2020 also refers to vision, perfect vision at present, and also perfect vision in hindsight. Once again, we are collaborating with Marriott Library, but for different reasons than we did 28 years ago. Our new book will be completely digital, primarily because we want to speak our history to future generations. And as a digital book, it will never accumulate any dust. It will not cost a penny to purchase. And it will be easy to add, to continue to add new chapters as history continues to unfold. Lurill's centennial book has been digitized as well, so it'll always be preserved as will our new edition, 2020. The Marriott Library offers us cutting edge software that can make this all possible. They have been most enthusiastic about partnering with us. And let me give you just a small sampling, a, a taste, if you will, of what we can all expect when the book is completed by the end of this year. So in writing, in writing about the church's involvement in justice seeking, for example, we, we not only reference Tim de Christopher in those years from about 2008 to 2013, but there will be, so as we're reading along in this, there'll be opportunities to click here. And what do you get? You get the news footage as carried live by our local TV stations about Tim's arrest and trial. Or you can click there and get to see the documentary, Bitter 70. Or, or you can get to hear Tim being interviewed by Doug Fabrizio in 2009. If you want to learn about the history of Jazz Vespers, you can click onto an interview with me, an interview with the musicians, hear a performance, and see the, the whole video of Jazz Vespers 25th anniversary. And if you don't want to spend a full two years reading this book, <laughs> if not longer. You can just, you can go to a timeline and say, gee, what happened in this church in 1997? Or what happened in 2011? And you'll be dialed in. Now, as exciting as this may be to contemplate, and we can't wait for the book to be finished, although it will never be finished unless we all become extinct, but one of the things that we discussed was the need, to, the need to convey the social, religious, and political environment in which these historical events took place. In other words, we would hope that the reader in uh, the year 2050 will get a sense beyond the things that happened in 2018 in this church. And the reader will receive a, a sense of Oh, so this, this is what life felt like around here when, when Trump was president. Or, or these, these were the kinds of things that people discussed here that, uh, that happened once we realized that climate change was no longer theoretical, but actually affecting our lives adversely. Now, we want the reader 100 years from now to know what we discussed during 
the coffee hour in these years leading up to 2020? What preoccupied our thoughts and actions and conversations? We, we believe that this will add a, a fuller dimension to simply reading about the events as they happened. So on this, the church's 128th birthday, I want to get a handle on what the issues were back in the day, back when First Church opened for business. I want to look for trends and controversies, not only in 1891, but also those couple of years before and after this church was established. What might have engaged the first generation of members in Salt Lake's first progressive religious institution. Well, it was a time very much like today, where populism entered mainstream politics. Poor people were pitted against the rich, white people were pitted against people of color, immigrants were pitted against nativists, and most of the issues were resolved in the courts, which meant that the white and wealthy classes were the only ones who could afford these uh, well-paid lawyers and emerged victoriously almost every time. Most of the 1891 membership of this church, and sometimes it takes just a, a little adjustment in, in the mind here to, to understand this, but most of the membership of this church, 1891, were young children during the Civil War. And those who went to college in, say, the 1870s, maybe 1880s, experienced a huge transition in higher education and in, in academic principles. Before the Civil War, just about every college in the country was religious, and mostly evangelical at that. College presidents were ministers, and every branch of scholarship was guided by religion. Two major influences began a gradual change right around the Civil War years or, or shortly thereafter. The first influence was Darwin's Origin of Species, which had the effect of, of planting seeds of doubt in the prevailing religious certainty that permeated this country. Secularization began boldly to take shape in universities, opening the door then, here's the second influence, opening the door to German models of higher education where academia was divided into different disciplines and departments. And each one, each department, lay claim to secular and scientific expertise. So when our forebears went to college, the social sciences were brand new. Sociology, anthropology, political science, economics, used the methods of science to validate their fields of study that had virtually, it was just inconceivable, had virtually nothing to do with religion. They had their own science. Now, Columbia University was the first school in the country to have a political science department, and that didn't happen until 1880. And the University of Michigan was next in making the study of political science available in 1881, just 10 years before this church got started. And just two years before this church was founded, Woodrow Wilson, with his newly minted PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins, published The Philosophy of Politics. This would have been unheard of just a few years before. The Philosophy of Politics. And this book prompted a whole new way for how Americans were urged to look at government. Suddenly, what was taking place in our inner cities, urban reformers, armed with this new knowledge of sociology, 
and political science, began to study the social problems in our big cities. And their conclusion stood as a bulwark against populism, declaring that the government, nobody else, but the government had a moral obligation to intervene and remedy the plight of the poor who were mostly people of color. To quote the historian Jill Lepore, in the 1890s, the spirit of populism and the empiricism of the social sciences drove American newspapers to a new found obsession with facts. Imagine that. <laughs> facts really mattered. Oh, to have been alive back then when facts were. <laughs> But you know, this was, this was all so new in the, in the newspapers as well. 1883, Joseph Pulitzer took over the newspaper, The New York World. 1887, William Randolph Hearst took over from his dad, the San Francisco Examiner. 1896, Adolph Oakes took over The New York Times. And these were the days when newspapers didn't fear allegations of libel, enabling the New York Times to regard William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic candidate for president in 1896, running against William McKinley. This is where the New York Times called Bryan, and I quote, an irresponsible, unregulated, ignorant, prejudiced, enthusiastic crank. I think this might have been the precursor to the tweet, you know, it's just nice. A couple of jabs, short and sweet. Now you can bet that our forebears discussed the presidential election of 1896. The Democrats added to their platform for the first time an income tax. An income tax, so that, in their words, the burdens of taxation may be equally and impartially laid to the end that wealth may bear its due portion of the expenses of government. And today's Unitarians continue the same discussion. But the wealthy, as just in our last, you know, tax break of last year, the, the wealthy always win, always have. And unless these new so-called socialists in the Democratic Party today can ignite a spark, the burden of taxes will continue to fall on those far less prosperous in society. I did like what William Jennings Bryan said about taxes. He said there are two ideas of government there are those who believe that if you will only legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, their prosperity will leak through on those below. But the Democrats have the idea that if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up through every class which rests upon them. You know, I, I never heard of this, this theory of trickle-up economy. I <laughs> defies gravity, but I kind of like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> By the way, William Jennings Bryan spent $300,000 on his election campaign. McKinley, a rather strong favorite among the business class, spent $7 million. But two things in particular about that race really stand out for me. One, this was the time, that 1896 race, a new political style emerged, was in the McKinley campaign, and using their boatload of money, they introduced politics into the arena of mass advertising. The Republicans in 1896 wanted to sell their candidates' personality using the business practice of slogans 
in billboards. And secondly, black men at that time hardly voted, and Chinese Americans and women, not at all. But it was the first time, you can imagine it, 1896, it was the first time that no one was killed at the polls. Really. What was certainly discussed in the coffee hour among the first members of this church was that, so they started 1891, the next year, 1892, America marked the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's crossing of the Atlantic. I wonder how many from this church went to Chicago that year to celebrate the Columbus ordeal at the World's Fair, which had representatives from 46 different nations and featured the first ever Ferris wheel. That's about my speed, the Ferris wheel. But the Chicago World's Fair unveiled some of the worst brutal, nasty aspects of American culture. Two significant lectures were delivered, one by Frederick Jackson Turner, a young historian who spoke, and if you can imagine him on a, on a platform, and as he was speaking, next to him were Native Americans caged. Can you imagine? So Native Americans were in cages as though it were a human zoo. And so he was, he was just talking on about, well, what he did was use the catchword of that time, which was evolution, to lecture on this great evolution of American democracy. He told the crowd that the American frontier was overrun with savages. And there they were in their cages. European immigrants then started coming to the U.S. and defeated the native people, taking possession of their homelands and erecting their, what he called, a real civilization. And he used evolution to illustrate the changes that took place, especially in the West, where step by step, America transformed into the great shining model of democracy and capitalism. Turner waxed eloquently about, well, the progress of humankind moving in stages from savagery to the civilization that we now all admire. The World's Fair also had designated a colored people's day. Black Americans posed in fake African villages. And Frederick Douglass spoke on the topic of the race problem in America. So his little state, the platform from, from where he spoke, was decked out with watermelons, and white hecklers were waiting for him. Douglas said, men talk of the Negro problem, but the problem is whether or not the American people have loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. It was Frederick Douglass's last public speech. Income inequality was a huge issue when this church began, as was race, and this, this populist unrest that, that was just spreading around the country. What was positively stunning was that in this wave of populism in the 1890s and the turn of the century, there was a strong call to socialism. Socialism was perceived as the antidote back then to society's systematic exploitation of the poor and the non-whites. Now the figure who led the socialist movement at that time was, of course, Eugene Debs, worked on the railroads. And the railroads were, were really kind of a, a microcosm for the, what can you say, the, the, the 
ruthless divisions in our country between rich and poor, the haves and have-nots, and actually to, to a large extent, masters and slaves. Now, this was a time when railroad workers struck time and time again for as many as 2,000 railroad men a year, 2,000 a year, were killed on the job, while another 20,000 were injured. And by 1893, two years after this church was in business, 1893, Debs had organized 150,000 members in the American Railway Union. So just kind of step back a bit and just imagine Imagine the coffee hour back then, 1893. Imagine discussing Debs and socialism and union just as this church was getting started in Salt Lake City. It had to be absolutely fascinating. Now, as we know, Debs ran for president five times beginning in 1900. He formed the Socialist Party in 1901. So what was the political pulse of this church then? Well, just a half a dozen years later, this church called the Reverend William Thurston Brown to be its minister, and half of his salary was compensated by the Socialist Society of Salt Lake City. In his later years, Eugene Debs Look back on his personal history and he said, well, there was a time in my life when I permitted myself as a member of the Democratic Party to be elected to state legislature. I've been trying to live it down. I'm as much ashamed of that as I am proud of having gone to jail. For Republicans and populists and white supremacists, Socialism was a dirty word. But so much like today, the critics of socialism don't, don't really know what it means. And I still like Eugene Debs' definition of socialism the best. What is socialism? It's Christianity in action. It recognizes the equality in all Now, who knows if history really repeats itself, but there's a definite correlation between populism and the rise of socialism. The socialism, which our forebears undoubtedly discussed and which colored their, their interfacing with society, that socialism eventually got absorbed into mainstream American life. And back then, that meant women's suffrage, it meant an end to child labor. It meant a minimum wage. Today, socialism, today it would mean health care for all. We'll get there. Socialism has a way of planting the seeds for a just society eventually. But our country today is still Still crazy after all these 128 years or so. Today, we're pitting rich against poor, manufacturing scapegoats to account for populist ideas on immigration. And however crazy it may seem, socialism is growing again these days as the remedy to the horrific wealth gap that bedevils this nation. And finally, I believe that our congregation today is just as crazy as was the congregation here in the late 19th century. You know, probably we too would, would call a socialist minister today if we had a chance. And our prophetic call as a church a prophetic call to tackle inequality remains just as strong as it ever was, and possibly even more so. Historically, this church is simply unwavering in its commitment to bring 
justice to the lives of those who still have been denied their human and civil rights. You know, talk about the prophetic church. I mean, the, the prophets of Israel were considered by most people in those days, some 3,000 years ago, to be crazy. But they were, I guess, actually only the, the socialists of that time. So when we opened this church 128 years ago, a progressive religion in a conservative desert, people thought we were crazy back then. And the work that we do today as a congregation dedicated to the uh, evolution of a just society, our work today is really not fully understood by many of our contemporaries around us. But you know, it kind of feels great being considered crazy still after all these many years. So on this, our anniversary of unleashing craziness in Salt Lake City and beyond, let us rejoice, let us be proud, let us be thankful to those who dare to plant progressive seeds right here in Utah. Oh, David, thank you. <laughs> those, those were the days. Oh, so sweet, so sweet. Let us break for coffee and...
probably the same conversation we had here 128 years ago. <laughs>